If you would like to support the podcast and get some extra content while you're there, head on over to patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast and sign up. From the rewatch to the Q&A, we will have loads of content every week. So sign up, patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast. And now, here's the podcast. Welcome, welcome everybody. It's episode 386 of the Severe MMA podcast. My name is Sean Sheehan, a.k.a. the pod god, the one championship maestro, the score lord, the legend, joined today by the uh, Jesse Lingard of Irish MMA media, Graham McDonald, as we talk a massive, 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 massive weekend in the world of mixed martial arts. Uh, UFC 280 went down. We'll obviously have a full breakdown of that. It was one of those cards like where it was pretty lackluster, I think, in the in the opening few fights. Then, then it turned into a pretty epic card in terms of things that happened, and we'll discuss all of that uh, as we uh, get into the podcast here. But before we get into all of that, we must give a massive shout out to our lead sponsor, The Legends, Manscaped. And it's an absolutely massive time if you're in Ireland for Manscaped because they're taking over in Ireland just in time for the holidays. Our life-changing hygiene products are going to be available in Tesco retail stores. It's also time for Fresh Ball Autumn here. They're calling it Fresh Ball Fall, but it's Fresh Ball Autumn if you're in uh, if you're in Ireland. It's a season of pumpkin spice and make and sure your crotch looks nice. That means sipping arters uh, in the fall breeze and using Manscaped products to trip, trim your balls with ease. Trip your balls? That wouldn't be very good. Sure, uh, Make sure to swing by and pick up the signature lawnmower, the most brilliant ball trimmer or bl- uh, to bless the motherland. Join the six million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by swinging by Tesco uh, in Ireland or going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the promo code SEVEREMMA. So use that promo code SEVEREMMA as well, but you you can, do you know what? Do you know what would be good in Tesco? Go in, have a look at it. See, oh, this is good. This is a pretty good product. You know, try something out in Tesco and then send off it for Manscaped. I know Manscaped do things as well where they, they do like, oh, you can get them every month, like the shampoo or the or whatever it might be. And uh, I think you get the prices cheaper. So that's very, very good. Um, so as I said, Ireland is is key for us, obviously, and key for Manscaped as well. And that's down to a, a lot of what uh, you lads say here, because, uh, you know, it's uh, you've given us great support, and obviously Manscaped um, see that and want to, uh, uh, want to uh, you know, come to Ireland and, and give all the Irish people their, uh, their products. So uh, whether you're brand new or already with us at Manscaped, you can use the crown jewel uh, of Care for Your Family June's the Lawnmower uh, 3.0. Uh, imagine shaving with a sleek, well-designed and optimised trimmer that makes shaving time your favourite time in the bathroom. Min, if you've been shaving with the same nut trimmer on your face, you've been doing it wrong. No person wants to end up with pubes in their mouth. The Lawnmower uh, 4.0 trimmer. Did I say 3.0? I didn't even mind them in 4.0. Uh, features proprietary advanced skin safe technology to protect your delicate parts. It's also waterproof so you can keep scaping as the weather's changing. Did I mention wireless charging? Oh, wireless charging? Does that, I didn't even I didn't even know it had word. I've been plugging it in the whole time. Uh, <laughs> the new wireless charging system uses electromagnetic induction. I might have the newest one, actually. John, let's get the newest one. Uh, which can help uh, battery length last longer. While we're on the topic of life-changing products, uh, who can forget the Manscaped's Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer? I'm needing that now. I'm getting older, if I'm being honest. The Weed Whacker is also waterproof and uh, provides proprietary skin safe technology, which helps reduce nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. Make sure to swing by test. Go Ireland and pick these products up for yourself, your father, your brother, or even your grandpa. Everyone needs a trim, and what better time to start autumn when the leaves are coming off the branch? So go to manscaped.com and get 20% off with free shipping with the code Severe MMA. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com when you use the code Severe MMA. Stop acting the maggot and get <laughs> and get a grip with Manscaped. Now available at Tesco Ireland. If you're listening to this Monday morning, I, th- I think they're in the shops now Monday morning. So, um, very, very good stuff altogether. Manscaped.com use the promo code severe MMA as well to get 20% off and free shipping. Right, Graham, it is uh it's a while. I I honestly, 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 I don't know where to start with these top three fights. I really, really don't know where to stop because it was like there I is think one. I think the, the main controversy that I've seen and the main talking point seems to be the Sean O'Malley uh, Yan decision. So maybe we should start there. We're gonna start with judging again. <laughs> is that what we're gonna do? Well, it seems to be that the hot topic uh, in the in the social medias and uh, online and all that uh, about the about the decision and loads of people calling robbery straight away and 
uh, all that stuff. So uh, it's been it's been a little while since we've had such a kind of outcry of robbery. It's, it's been pretty smooth sailing for the for the judges. Obviously, there's been a couple here or there or whatever uh, that we've mentioned, but. Uh, it reminds me of the old days where every time it had kind of a big fight decision was close and went went uh, away that people didn't think it should go. There was there was these uh, robbery outcries and we're we're back there with this one. Uh, Do I don't know, know your thoughts. I don't know your thoughts on it, but yeah. uh, we'll get into it. But uh, I, I I saw you had scored it for Peter Yan, and mm-hmm. I saw like I I basically saw everybody had scored it for Peter Yan, uh, Peter Yan, and. I don't know. Watching, I watching it. I thought that O'Malley did enough in the first round. I thought Jan clearly won the second round, and I thought O'Malley clearly won the third round. I thought the first round was really close, but I do think uh, O'Malley was doing well on his bike, landing his his shots and getting out of there. And anything Jan did land was kind of with O'Malley moving away from it or with, with uh, Jan reaching for it. And yeah, it was a really close round. But I, I, I at the time, I thought, oh, maybe I missed a big strike here or something that has everybody giving this this round to Jan. But I watched the back. Uh, yeah, I think O'Malley won that fight. I know that's a very unpopular opinion, and people calling it a robbery and all that stuff. But I think he did he did enough in the first round. I think the second round and third round are, are clear enough. Uh, the first round, you can definitely you know if it went the other way, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be calling it a robbery. I think it was a, a razor close round. But I uh, I do think the you know Jan didn't really get anything off uh, that landed in, in any way clean, and obviously um, there was no like big kind of. Uh, shot that stunned Jan or anything from O'Malley, but he was landing the better stuff in my opinion and, and won the fight. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm in the minority here, and I, I saw you scored it for Jan as well. So uh, yeah, I'd like to call you out and say, oh, as the president of the judging society and all, there's a robbery here. But I, I actually thought that was the correct decision at the time, and yeah. I watched it back, and I still think it's the correct decision. I, I watched it back and had a lot of different thoughts. The only thing I would, uh, all you said there, I could disagree with you, but I couldn't argue with you in terms of. Uh, there's nothing you said was wrong there. The only thing I would say is when you said clearly in some of the rounds, I don't think there were any of these rounds were clear. Uh, yeah, well, I think it was mm-hmm. yeah, maybe clear is, is a bit of a, a bit of a stretch, but compared to the first round, I thought that the second and third round were quite straightforward. I would actually disagree uh, with that. I, I on, on rewatch, I think I almost think the opposite. I nearly think the the first round. You, on, before I get into that, right before I get into the scoring, do you know what we have here? We don't we have Graham expectancy bias. It's back. It's it's rare. It's ugly head again, and it didn't catch you. It fucking caught me on rewatch, and I think it caught most people out there. Now, when we talked about expectancy bias last, and you obviously coined that phrase, and it's a very very good phrase. Uh, people are expecting Yan to come in here and win this fight. They're expecting him to win the first round, and when the first round was close, they gave it the end. They're expecting him to win the fight. They're expecting him to land the harder shots, and they'll score him with the harder shots. They're betting on Yan as well, which is obviously a big thing when you see the reaction online when it's robbery, 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 robbery. I I bet on Yan. I had Yan as one of my... Uh, I, I I actually betting him for the chaos so of the decision. It didn't matter if I gave it to O'Malley or, or whatever. But he was in my betting show as one of the bets and it was a finish as well, so it didn't make a difference. But Yeah, I picked Peter Yan on the on the picks as well. 100%. So like, you know... 100%. Like I'm, no, not no. like I'm like, oh, Sean, Mal- Sean O'Malley, I told you he was going to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. So I... Look, I watched the fight when I was watching it live, right? Here was what I thought. I thought the first round was very close, but I thought Yan just did a little bit better. I thought it was very even on the feet. He got that takedown, landed a few shots um, on the ground, and there wasn't yeah, much there of a difference in it. Those shots. I, yeah, I would agree, but not much. But when it's very close, I think that made a difference there. Now, I'll tell you what I thought afterwards in a second. Uh, the second round, I thought it was like not all Yan but I thought he landed the harder shots and he did the better work uh, and in in the third honestly like so I scored the first two rounds for Yan live and I was t- about to tweet out my score of the third round and I had 3027 typed out and I was just about to like tweet it and I I pulled back and I went 29 28 so I gave the third to O'Malley but I thought that was so close right so that's how I scored it live uh thinking that the big shot from O'Malley early was massive and even though Yan kind of probably won the rest of the round in the third, O'Malley's bigger shot was the biggest thing, and you should score it for that, which I kind of had to remind myself. I think it was actually round. two shots. It was a body shot followed by a head shot. That were, I think it actually stunned him yeah. and opened up the head shot. I think it was actually two uh, really That's impactful fair, yeah. strikes from O'Malley in a row. That's fair. So on the rewatch, and I kind of watched it in the call the day this morning, kind of knowing what happened, no expectancy bias, just looking at it, fighter A versus fighter B. 
that first round I couldn't have been more wrong like it was, this is the first time in a long time where I'm thinking what the fuck was I watching scoring that first round for Jan O'Malley definitely won that first round like without a shadow of a doubt I, in my, now that's obviously been a hyperbole there it's a, it's a close round and you're not mad if you scored it for Jan but I think pick it fine tooth comb if a judge goes back and watches that O'Malley's landing lovely straight lefts right down through the middle someone actually sent me a tweet after I watched it and I, they made a good point maybe it was Scroobius paper or maybe it was someone else I know a few people were kind of uh, chiming in with, with some good opinions on it but like Jan was throwing a lot of big shots and they looked nice but they actually weren't landing I thought Sean O'Malley did very well defensively uh, in that first round and he was landing power shots uh, relative power shots and hitting Peter Jan pretty well and if watching it back I think, I think it was more crisp shots than crisp power shots, shots but yeah, it was that's, the better that's a Good, better yeah. impactful work yeah. better worked out crisp is a great word for it absolutely the second round uh, it was closer than I watched uh, than I remembered but I do I do think Jan won look I think everyone gave Jan that second round he landed some good shots so O'Malley was probably just about ahead on, on the feet I would say but when Jan did get it to the ground he did land some good shots uh, there was one kind of crisp shot that knocked O'Malley's head against the, the, the cage a little bit and I think that was enough in a close round to, to win it for Jan I so. think there was, in that round there was a big shot from Jan that snapped O'Malley's head back yeah. at one stage as well on the third round though I think it's very interesting and this is a round I think that could be debated over and over and over again and I think it's about opinion and now having said that right there's three judges sitting there and uh I know two of them very, very well. Uh, for uh, you know, I know one of them very, very well, but I know two of them very, very well as judges. And I would trust their opinion on the fight more than me or you or anyone listed to base who landed the more impactful shots. Now, I disagree with both lads I'm talking about because I actually scored it for Yan on my rewatch, but it was very, very close. Like, I thought O'Malley in the shot you said, you know, he landed uh, the body shot and then the big shot which opened up Yan on rewatch. It looked to me like it was actually the cut that made Yan kind of stumble away and try to get to distance rather than the actual shot itself. And I actually think the shot that didn't came from Yan actually hurt O'Malley more than the O'Malley shot, shot hurt Yan. And as I said earlier on, when I was scoring it initially, I scored it for O'Malley based on that first initial shot being the biggest shot in the round and impacting Yan more than uh, anything else that Yan threw impact on it. And then when I went, watched it back, I kind of revised that. And then for me, Yan won the rest of the round, although it was still relatively close. So I, th- I think Yan won that third round. So I went from scoring the first uh, and the second for Yan to scoring the second and the third for Yan on rewatch. So I changed two of my scores. Now, obviously, the, the judges can't do that. And, and uh, still very, very close. That third round, honestly, I, I don't think... I, I watch him back if anyone's able to watch it with a fine tooth comb you pick the winner of the first round as O'Malley you pick the winner of the second round as Yan and that third round it really comes down to interpretation it really comes down to the experience of watching fights over and over and do you know what that is also the start of fight that's sitting there cage side and being able to see the look on someone's face being able to hear the impact of the shot would really be able to help you that's why sitting at home watching it or sitting you know in, in a, a, an empty void backstage to score a fight is not a good idea Idea, I don't think, and that's the way I saw it. Any part of that you disagree with, or did you? Yeah, in the third round, I thought Jan was uh, reaching on his shots, and um, a lot of them. And I thought the crisper work, even though uh, obviously both guys had slowed down, I thought the crisper work was being done by Sean O'Malley, and I thought he won that round. But it definitely was a close. It was definitely a close round, but uh, I felt, you know, on first watch and on rewatch that that O'Malley won that round and, and won the first round, giving him the scorecard, but. You know, even the second round, it was uh, Jan on boat watches for me, but it was it was close as well. And you know, if you're if you're um, putting more weight into a certain body shot or a certain head strike, you, you you could you could you know score that round a different way. I think you could say that with nearly all of the rounds, or you could say that with all of the rounds. So all of this talk of robbery and all that stuff, I think that's just definitely uh, not a robbery. I, I, I don't I don't know why you know it's kind of reared its head here. You know, as I said earlier, it hasn't we haven't really had this kind of you know, unanimous kind of, not unanimous, but uh, loud uh, majority of people seem to be calling it a robbery. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, to me... Do you, uh, do you think it's expectancy you know, bias? Uh, um, yeah, I think I think it probably is. I think you kind of mentioned, there's probably a few factors in it. You know, people had, uh, you know, a lot of people do like John O'Malley's stick or whatever, but a lot of people probably don't like it. A lot of people probably prefer uh, Jan's kind of no-nonsense kind of... Uh, approach to to MMA um 
a lot of people probably had, you know, yarn and accumulators and things like that, or had money on yarn or had picked yarn and stuff like that. And maybe that clouds it as well. But, um, you know, when they, when you see online, a lot of people, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people kind of get their opinions from other people. So they see somebody that they respect saying, oh, that's definitely a yarn round. That's definitely a yarn round. And then the decision comes out. And also the odds as well. People looking at the odds and seeing apparently yeah. Jan was like minus 700, minus 800 before, the, before just before the fight ended. So I think it's a number of factors, but I definitely think expectancy bias plays into it um, as well. Yeah, look, that's definitely a fight that... You, you can score 29, 28 either way. When, and it's so close. Like, it's so, so, so close. Like, there's there's no doubt about it. If you look at that fight, uh, that third round and you say, well, Sean O'Malley did the more damage. If you look at the, like, the physical damage, absolutely, I can see that every day of the week. There's absolutely no problem with that. I scored it from the first time around. Like, let's say if I went back and I just rewatched the first round, then I'd have a 29, 28 O'Malley. And I could still have a 29, 28 O'Malley. Honestly, I'm very, very torn still on that third round. And it's it's a close fight. This is not a robbery. Like, did... I had someone saying, uh, sending me a tweet today and they're like, if you don't call this out for what it is, you're an absolute shill in the back pocket of the UFC and all this. And I'm like, I'm just trying to say the truth here. Like, I had Yan winning. I, 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 I had the person who you all said won winning and I watched it again and I had him yeah. winning again. And it's possible to score at 30-27 and make a good argument for it yes. and not to be wrong. You Absolutely. Know I, mean? I, I nearly did that last night without without a shadow of a doubt. But let's talk about the fight itself, I suppose. I thought it was a very, very interesting fight. Like, Jan Early was leading pretty well and he was landing some leg kicks, but the, those straights from O'Malley were really, really good. Um, and they, we, we failed to kind of mention it as well, I suppose, in the second round. They both got badly hurt, but hit really, really hard. It kind of evened itself out, I suppose. And this was a fight that kept kind of evening itself out. One thing I noticed massively in this fight, right, and it's a big issue in Peter Jan's career, when he is allowed to kind of lead the dance, he fights at like a slower pace. You know, he's when, when O'Malley hit him hard both times, he hit him back really fucking hard. When he's brought into a firefight, he wins that firefight almost every time. But when you fight him at like a slower, longer pace, even though he's like, that's on his way up. He was excellent at that. He's not the biggest man in the world, but he's great at cutting off the cage and being nasty as he leads. And just over the last few fights, it feels like that has kind of left him a little bit. And uh, Jan, I don't know, maybe he needs to, I don't know what he needs to do, but it... it do, you, do you think he was kind of in the routine of fighting five-round fights and he kind yeah. of fought at a five-round fight pace? I, I Maybe, because I said it before, I tweeted out, like, if Jan fights at a bigger three-round pace, I don't think O'Malley would be able to stand up to it. And, like, if you think about it, like, Jan probably threw... Uh, how, how many 100% shots do you think Yan threw in that three rounds? Like, mm. 10? Like, yeah, you're probably right. After being tagged is when he kind of, yeah. you know, <laughs> did his best work and threw his, threw his best strikes. And I suppose that's part of that is O'Malley thinking I have this guy hurt and kind of moving in and maybe becoming the aggressor and not, not staying on his bike like he had been doing successfully, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it kind of, you know, does one does one lead to the other or how much is it O'Malley and how much is it uh, Jan, you know, uh, O'Malley letting his defensive guard down and Jan, uh, you know, swinging for the fences. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. O'Ma- yeah. O- O'Malley was very good though. Like he, he got into the fight even more as he started landing his jab really well. Obviously landed that knee that cut him and hurt him. It was, uh, look, a lot of people didn't like this matchmaking and they thought it was going to be one-sided and that look, that's part of obviously the expectancy bias as well with the uh, with the scoring. But God almighty, Yan, uh, or sorry, O'Malley proved that he is a top fighter in this division. There's no doubt about it, I think, after this. It was an absolutely phenomenal performance. Whether you had him winning or whether you had him losing, he... He stood up to it physically. He showed he had a chin. He showed that he can <coughs> tactically work against a guy like Yan. And he actually showed really good composure when yeah. he was hurt as well. Yeah, he he definitely did, and it, that's a learning fight. Like we had a few guys with learning fights, I suppose, uh, on Saturday night. And it was definitely one for him. And uh, yeah, look, I thought he was very, very good, and definitely vaults himself into uh, into. The upper echelon, Graham, of uh, of that yeah. division, very very good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He definitely either way, whatever you whatever way you scored it, these were these were close rounds against a really really high level guy, an upper echelon guy who's proven at the top level. So, you know, a lot of people think he should be champion, all that stuff. So it's definitely um, a kind of coming of age moment for Sean O'Malley, and it's kind of been lost in the 
lost in the discussion about the decision and who won the fight and all this robbery talk that Sean O'Malley actually kind of proved what everybody had been kind of doubting about him, that he can actually hang at the very top level and that he's not just, uh, you know, able to win fights against hand-picked opponents. So it, it's a little bit of a shame for Sean O'Malley uh, in terms of that, but maybe when the, the dust settles a bit, maybe that'll be the the kind of shine that he deserves from from such a good performance against Jan uh, and, in my opinion, a brilliant win. Uh, either way, anyway, yeah, a brilliant performance, uh, a kind of, you know, uh, a, a performance that answered a lot of questions uh, about him. You know, obviously, uh, he's he, there's been a lot of kind of, you know, doubting of him. A lot of people... A lot of people kind of think, ah, he's just the, you know, the hair and the personality and the the persona is is what's got him here. But he proved, uh, in my opinion, that he can hang with the best of them, and I don't think that should be overlooked in, in all of this. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. I think both of these fights are, ver- are both of their next fights are very interesting as well, though, because like. <sighs> it's it's weird because I, I'm not criticizing Yan for his ability or anything like that. I think he's a great fighter and I'd actually only say this about someone who's great, but I, you don't, you nearly expect better from him. And like when you do expect better from someone, you think they don't perform well, like it does bring down the other person's performance a little bit. Now, and now having said that, I've obviously just given great praise to O'Malley, but having said that, he's proved himself at a certain level. Who, what level did Jan fight in, that, at, 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 in this fight? And what level will O'Malley fight at in his next fight? And what level will Jan fight at in his next fight? So very, very interesting to see where both of them go. There's talks of O'Malley versus Cheeto Vera. I think that'd be a good fight. It'd be a very, very interesting one uh, if he doesn't get a title shot. And obviously we'll talk about that in a second uh, when we talk about the core main event. But let's talk about the main event um, because this was such an interesting fight. And it was... A way more one-sided than I was expecting, to be honest. And I, I picked Mikachev to win. He, he actually did all of the things I expected him to do to Charles Oliveira, but he did him in in a way more dominant way uh, than I expected. Like Charles got hit hard very early, and we were talking on, on the previous show about the striking and everything else. And our lads were kind of giving out to each other and saying, uh, you, you know, what one lad was saying that Charles was going to destroy him, and the other lad was saying that uh, you know Ian and Ian and, and Harry were kind of going back and forth to each other. And I was kind of saying, like, Jesus, lads, we don't, we actually don't know what's going to happen. Let's see what happens. And we saw what happened, and what we saw was that Islam Akachev was just a better striker than Charles Oliveira, and Charles Oliveira didn't have the, and I mean this very, very strong, you know, Charles Oliveira didn't have the ability to adjust his game plan to beat someone like Islam Akachev. He just didn't. That was the absolute crux of this, because he pulled guard early in the first round. I know they, they were calling, and I'm not getting into the commentary now, because someone like literally unsubscribed the other day and goes, it's because you talk too much shit about the commentary. And do you know what? Fuck them. I'm going to continue to do it, but not at the moment. Um, the commentary was like, oh, he took he took him down. He did not. Charles Oliveira uh, pulled guard early in that first round. You know, Islam tried to pass and Oliveira got up. It wasn't Oliveira that got up himself again. It wasn't Oliveira threatening. He did absolutely nothing there. Islam dominated him in the clinch. Islam took him down. He was on top for a long period. He landed a ground pound. Charles was threatening with absolutely nothing apart from a, a laid up kick. Early exchanges again. Islam was winning. Clinch again. Islam was winning. Out on defeat. Islam was winning. Technical battle. And Charles Oliveira was fighting that range, but not fighting the range fight he needed to fight. Dropped hard and submitted basically after that. It, it was it was like as if Charles Oliveira was expecting to go in there and do what he does to all those other guys uh, against Islam Makachev, and he just was, was completely outmatched in this fight. Like, completely and utterly outmatched. Everything that Oliveira does, he's like berserker style on the feet because he's not afraid to get the fight to the ground. He, he tried to do that at the start. Makachev hit him with one left hand. Then it turned into a technical battle and Makachev was just better than him in that technical battle. When the fight went to the ground, Makachev was just better than him on the ground. He, he absolutely uh, did nothing uh, on the ground at Oliveira. And it, it wasn't that he did not. He actually tried hard everywhere with all different things. It was just that Makachev is so superior. And this may sound like me downgrading Charles Oliveira or giving out a... It's actually Makachev is just so good that he could do absolutely nothing. Like, people look at Makachev and go, oh, he's the next Habib. Makachev is a far, far, far superior striker to Habib. He's a far superior all-round MMA fighter. Habib 
unbelievable, you know, Sambo fighter, unbelievable wrestler, did this like power pressure thing that was able to get people to the ground and he was able to win fights in a very specific way. But Makachev is an all round fighter. There is no bad parts of Makachev's game. There's it may, maybe like an elite striker with good takedown defense could beat him in a striking match or maybe something like that. It'd have to be a very, very, very good fighter to beat Makachev. But when you when you're like um I don't it's hard to describe what Charles Oliveira. He's like a dangerous fighter, like he's a finisher. We've seen Oliveira in the last few fights show like weakness. He's not like a, he's he hasn't been a dominant fighter over his last four or five fights or whatever. He's almost lost nearly all of them while still being unbelievably exciting, unbelievably effective, effective, unbelievably good. But he came up against the guy who is the elite of the elite. Like this is this is different gravy. Like this is this is like you know, some pre- team in the Premier League goes on like a five uh, game win, Man United, let's say, they go on a five game win streak, they find a way to beat teams, you know, they, they find like this striker who's, you know, head scoring loads of headed goals with good crosses from your unbelievable left back or something, and then they play Man City and lose 5-0. You know, that's what this is. That's what this is. And Makachev was just an absolutely different level to Charles Oliveira. Graham, on the way into the fight, you talked about Oliveira and seeing him, not necessarily him giving up, but seeing him outmatched and beaten. Do you do you feel like fulfilled in what you said or do you think it went differently to what you expected? Uh, I, um, I don't think feel fulfilled in what I said. I think uh, he was just, you know, looking back on it, he was completely outmatched. Uh, you know, it's hard. It's funny to say because he was obviously, you know, the champion and recently and things like that. But he just looked like he, he it was a different level out there. You know, I think his game plan wasn't great. You know, even in the second round, going for body locks and things like that, just just awful. But yeah, yeah, his striking, I think he needed to make something happen early. And my my kind of concern was was you know the level of competition coming into this was was a lot different than how is how is um, Makachev's uh, striking going to look against uh, against a, a guy who can you know uh, fight at range and you know throw kind of crazy strikes but even even when he did try to throw crazy strikes Oliver throwing like a jumping knee is just fucking stupid I, I just think he he fought badly in a match that he in a fight that he was badly outmatched in and uh, because Makachev's striking is obviously a lot better than I expected it to be uh, or I thought it was it may not look like the prettiest or whatever but it's extremely functional uh, he's got good timing I think he showed that Uh Maybe, uh, you know, looking forward to somebody beating him in the future. He did look to me to be getting a little bit tired. Uh, I don't know if that was just he was going to get a second win, but he did look a little bit like he was slowing down. But obviously, it was a very high paced fight as well uh, at the same time. And, um, you know, obviously, he could have maybe he could have just caught a second win and gone through it. But, yeah, I think I don't think Oliver necessarily, you know, quit at the first sign of, of danger or anything like that. But he... I think he knew he was beaten and maybe could have, if he was, you know, uh, not completely outmatched in the fight and had kind of a, uh, either a striking or a grappling um, uh, advantage or striking advantage, then he he might have kind of fought harder to stay in the fight. But yeah, I think he knew his race was run and he and he was he was going to lose that fight. So yeah, yeah, I don't feel like it was the old Charles Oliver. I just think you know sometimes you're beaten and you're just beaten. 100%. Do you know what, Oliveira, it kind of reminded me of... Do you ever see lads... Uh, Patrick always says this, I'd love to see a fight where a lad just like walks forward and throws everything and just kind of goes mad and wins a fight that way. Like, that's the way Oliveira has been fighting. But like, why is that... Why is that not a good way to win in MMA, right? It's not a good way to win in MMA because someone with technique will always beat someone who fights like that. Now, not saying Charles Oliveira doesn't fight with technique, and when he does the berserker stuff, there is reason and rhyme behind it, I suppose. But a lot of that is predicated on his ability and has been predicated on his ability to uh, destroy someone on the ground. You know, people were kind of joking that Charles Oliveira invented an eight count in MMA because he'd get knocked down or fall down and he'd get eight seconds on the ground to stand back up because everyone was so afraid to go down to the ground with him. Yeah, the same thing with Verdun for years. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. But when that option was taken away, 
because Makachev is so good on the ground as well, he wasn't able to play the berserker on the feet, and then it turned into a technical matchup with a guy who was certainly more technical than him, who was also beating him when it was a berserker matchup because of that te- uh, technical ability and the fact he wasn't afraid of him on the feet because he wasn't afraid to go to the ground. It was just impossible. It was an impossible matchup. Yeah. Like I was just thinking, like if you were, you know, even with the benefit of hindsight, looking back at the tape, if you're Charles Oliveira's camp, what game plan do you, uh, uh, do do you, you wanna, make to, uh, to beat him in this fight? Yeah. You know what I mean? I was it's thinking. Very difficult. I'd be interested to know what you think of that. I think the only, and I suggested this in the previous show, and haven't watched the fight. I think the only way you can do it is like long, hard jabbing and one twos right down the middle. You are the, the taller is, fighter. Is Charles able to do that though? I don't, I don't, I don't think know so, if he, no. he's ever shown that he's able to do that. Maybe maybe he is like if if he I, I don't think he is. I think he's it's just not in his nature to yeah, I don't play that really patient jab, you know, that Sean O'Malley first round tactic. I don't think that's him. Other than that, I'm stumped. <laughs> like, like, we played the berserker and tried to knock him out, but that didn't work. He tried to do it early. Maybe he should have stuck to that and, you know, kill or be kill type of thing like he did in his last few fights. But he wasn't, like, Islam didn't allow him to do that. And as I said in the previous show as well, coming in, if he did that, what's Islam going to do? He's just going to step under and take him down. The second the fight got to the ground, yeah. like... You know, probably the best thing is to just easy. swing at him. When you get hurt, keep swinging, you know, like, kind of yeah. like when Jan got hurt against O'Malley, he, he kind of landed his best stuff because you catch the guy coming in trying to finish. Maybe that could have been his best route to victory, but that's, uh, you know, that's a dangerous game you're playing there as well. But, 100%. Like looking back on it, like I, I thought it was, I thought Oliver was going to have a advantage on the feed, and he just, he just didn't. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's an extremely difficult matchup for him. Like you know, if even if they did a rematch, I don't see it get, going any other way. No, so no. yeah, absolute uh, dominant performance from Makachev, and he proved himself at the top level. You know, he he definitely had some questions coming in. Is you know, Bobby Green, people like Dan Hooker and stuff are, are good wins, and he was dominant, but. This is a, you know, this performance show that he really, really is a, a upper echelon top, top guy. And, yeah. you know, he's going to be a real problem for everybody going forward. A hundred percent. I think as well, just to say here, obviously we've talked a lot over the last few years about jiu-jitsu at the top level of MMA. And, you know, I've joked, obviously, of it not working at the top level and jiu-jitsu as a plan A and things. Um but this really shows what I've been talking about for for all that time. When you have someone with the ability to control and not put themselves in bad positions and know how to defend against someone who is really, really, really good, then that jiu-jitsu just will not work at that level. It just will not work. And when you, you know, everyone wanted to see Habib Nurmagomedov versus Tony Ferguson. Well, you saw a better version of Tony Ferguson against, you know, uh, I, I would say a better version of Habib if I'm on it. I don't think Islam is as good as Habib on the ground, per se, but you, so you have a better version of Tony Ferguson against, like, a slightly worse version of Habib on the ground, and that version of Habib on the ground submitted the better version of, of Tony Ferguson. So that, I suppose, will tell you all. If, if anyone was wondering, oh, I wish I, you know, I knew how that fight would go, there you go, you got your answer. But, you know, you said, what's next for Islam? Who, who beats him? I actually, like, I don't think Islam is an unbeatable fighter. I think he's a very, very, very good fighter, and only the, the best of the best will even have a chance at beating him. This, if we're talking about horses for courses, was a terrible matchup for Oliveira that, you know, it turned out more terrible than it actually looked on paper even. But, like... If you look at certain guys in the division, if if a guy has good takedown defense and if he can strike very, very well and very technically, he could beat him. And can stick to a game plan yes. really, really well. Like Alex- Volkanovski can. Alexander Volkanovski. Like, uh, how big is Islam? Let me just uh, let me just uh, pull it up oh, here now. Know, like, uh, Volkanovski is not even a big featherweight. <laughs> no. So Islam is five foot ten. He's not massive, like, so... What's Volkanovski, 5'7 or 5'8 or something like that? Yeah, so, like, uh, I, I, he has a massive, massive advantage uh, on him. I, I, I think it's a, a phenomenal matchup like, because Volkanovski, very, very good takedown defense, but also fights in a way that doesn't have to use his takedown defense because his striking is so good. He's a better technical striker than Mikachev, but obviously Mikachev's still very, very good. It's a fascinating matchup for me. Like, I, I think the old... Um, the old super fights are a little bit overplayed. Obviously, they went way too far with all the Henry Cejudo, Daniel Cormier and stuff after McGregor popularized it. Uh, well, he didn't. Po- he popularized it after he, he did it, I suppose, because everyone wanted to do it then. But this one, 
I feel very sorry for the winner of uh, Cater and Allen, especially if it's Allen and a few other lads in that division. And it all, it's always the same with featherweight. But this is a phenomenal fight. And I always say, give me a great fight and I'm not going to complain about it. And by God, this yeah. is a great fight. Yeah, to be honest, it's it, it, it's really really interesting fight. I like it's hard to know how it's going to look. Like when guys are coming up division divisions as well. Like how much time has Volkanovski been planning this for? Um, you know, it's a, it's a he made one fifty five last Friday anyway. So <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I think you know, in the back of your mind, you probably kind of it's a strange situation to be in as a backup fighter you probably know that like 90 90 percent you're not going to fight or even more but you kind of have to stay ready it's a it's a strange situation but but anyway it's it's worked out for him because he's positioned himself uh into into a title shot at, at 155 and you know people in the past complain about fighters coming in and never fought in the division and all this stuff for uh getting a title shot but I'm the same as you. Uh, intriguing matchup like this against two guys with, with really good fight IQ. You know, uh, a chance for Volkanovski to kind of really, you know, get the respect that he already deserves, in my opinion, that he hasn't really been getting from from outside of the hardcores. And there's, there's a lot. Of, it's, it's an intriguing match, a matchup on a lot of levels. And you know, you mentioned Arnold Allen and Qatar there, uh, Calvin Connor. There, I think for them, it's actually probably you know for Allen if he wins, I think. Another one before going in against Makachev will be uh, good for him. So I don't think, I don't think you know it's it's like fucking him over or sorry screwing him over or anything like that too badly. Um, so yeah, I think actually you know the more I think about this, the more you know it doesn't make too much sense, but it makes a little bit of sense. And you know it's MMA; it doesn't really have to make sense as long as. As long as it's a really good matchup, I'm fucking. See, I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to it. See, Cater and uh, and Alan. That's next week, right? Yeah. Throw an interim title on that. Let's do it. Let's just do it. Like, do ah. it. Do it right now. Why? Those are the two lads right up there at the top of the division. Okay, Josh Emmett, maybe. Throw an interim title on that. Maybe the winner fights Emmett, and then the winner down the line fights. Why, why do you uh, need Volkanovski? the interim title? You can just because make it a number one contender. Vol- or like Volkanovski now is not. Uh, he's not he's not going to be fighting again until February. So what's that? Five months away. Then he's not going to be fighting for at least like another three to five months. He's not going to be fighting for for ten months. He's not going to be fighting for a year, maybe. Like you know, it might be that long. Well, just put an interim title on there. Keep the division going. Like if um Aaron Lana wins at the weekend, he's probably going to have to fight Josh Emmett in because of Volkan obviously he's going to be away. Let's get the belt on the line and let's get it on the line straight away. And then at least when Volkanovski comes back, we'll have someone uh who we know is the champion and we'll have like a, a super fight in again if you want to it's not, not that but you know the, the, the interim titles on the line in the apex is just like come on i, I know okay the fact is if it wasn't on the apex i think it'd actually be a better idea but still and all i think they should just do it like what why would you not do it i think i, I don't think there's a massive reason not to it's a five-round fight already Vulcan does, does it, just does, you know like away. wwe or whatever they probably have like you know they don't they wouldn't have the title uh, up for grabs or change hands on like a tiny show in Dublin or whatever you know mm, they've I mean? done it plenty of times over the last couple of years do, do, well yeah, maybe I, well, like you know it, w- would it in people's eyes degrade the belt if it was just you know in a no. dark room in the apex with 20 people there like. well that happened probably 20 times over the last two years has it degraded it then yeah, but that was under different circumstances where you actually well, weren't fair. able to put on shows. That's uh, fair, yeah. You know, I, they could put on Arnold Allen for an interim title somewhere in Europe or in the UK absolutely. and it'd be huge. And if it's in the apex, it just seems kind of shitty to me. Uh, absolutely, but if you're planning this over four months, I'm planning this over five days, like, you know? I want them to announce it tomorrow and do it next Saturday. And, okay, that's just me going mad. We've other things to talk about. So, But, like, I, I think that it makes sense with, with Volkanovski being there. Anyway, um... Yeah, great win for uh, for Islam Makachev, and he is the the new champion. There was a fight in the stands then between um, uh, Shemaev, who was with Kadarov. Oh, I, I, I saw a bunch of handbags, a bunch of nothing happening. Yeah, a bunch of nothing. And he who was with who, uh, Abu Bakr and Magomedov, who fought uh, Gadzi Omar Gadziev earlier on. I don't know, just like this whole fucking sitting alongside dictators' sons and shit like that, and all this politics. It's like. God almighty, lads. 
isn't it amazing too like how many MMA fighters I saw someone actually tweet this the other day and it's very interesting now I, it's different now dictators fuck the dictators but like whether you're on the right or the left or whatever you are the amount of MMA fighters who are like willing to like stand up for like the polit- political person they know but won't fucking stand up for themselves and fight against Dana White or against the UFC and try to actually get more stuff for themselves is, is actually astonishing like you'll bootlick for other fucking people but you won't fight for yourself it's a, it's actually ridiculous like but anyway uh yeah and i wonder i wonder why they're doing that as well anyway um we will go on sterling and dillashaw this was an absolute sham of a title fight if we're being honest um take nothing away from sterling look he went in and he won and he did what he needed to do so i'm not Given out about Sterling, and it's I feel I actually feel really bad for Aljamain Sterling because like if he gone in and just won this fight and it was a normal fight, it actually probably would have been like a little bit of not not necessarily a coming of age for him, but he had the, obviously the end disqualification and you know the whole Oscar Sterling thing and all that, and then obviously it was a very close fight the last time out and people were talking about the ten eights and robberies again and all of this shit. Uh, and if he had won this, at least there would have been none of the talk after. And he did win it. And there isn't that sort of talk for Sterling. But like the fact that this was just a joke of a fight because Dillashaw went in there injured. And not only did he go in there injured, he told them he went in there injured. Like he told Mark Goddard in the back. And I think Mark Goddard is the best referee in the world and has improved the no end over the last few years. But like, why didn't Goddard or the commission or whatever in the background say, okay, so you know you're going to dislocate your shoulder. You have a badly dis- uh, bad shoulder injury. Well, you're uh, not fighting. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't have said it like that. Like MMA fighters going into fight, they always have injuries and they always say, oh, no, it'll be grand. It'll be grand. Uh, it just. But he did tell it. He, he said, like, yeah, he, Goddard he said, said he, he had some problem, but he said, he probably said uh, it's only, you know, 25 minutes. Uh, it'll be uh, fine. I, I, you know, he, he, they lied to themselves and say they'd be grand. That, yeah, that's going in that, Okay, fair enough. Yeah, maybe. Maybe and I'm not like I'm not I'm I'm actually like I'm actually not criticizing Goddard too much and I'm not criticizing TJ too much either but like it's a, it, someone in there should have taken a decision not to have us a, a sham of a fucking fight because that's what it was it was an absolute sham of a joke of a fight like Dillashaw said it afterwards oh, I'm sorry sorry for the vision I held it up like what TJ Dillashaw was doing here and make no mistake about it right he was getting the last big payday of his career and he knew very fucking well. He was like, I'm going to go in here injured. I'm going to lose. He like, he lost on purpose. He absolutely went in there knowing he was going to lose. Took a big payday and was like, thanks for the cheese. Good luck. Which is like, Grant, I'd probably do the same if I'm being honest. You know, if I was injured, I go in, like I go in five seconds, tap out. He fought on. He was tough or whatever you can say, TJ. But this was a sham of a fight. Like I paid 30 quid for this fucking thing. People over in America paying, uh, paying 100 quid or 70 quid or whatever it is. And this is what's delivered up. It was. I thought it was a joke. To be honest, I thought it was an absolute farce. Like, yeah. what are the medicals beforehand? Like, what are the medicals beforehand? Like, we well, like Michael Bisbing's in there fighting with one eye, and they think he's fighting yeah. in there with two eyes. So, like, it's obviously ridiculous. not. It is not. They're yeah. taking the fighters' word for it to get these fights to go ahead. And you know, it's an amazing story, like Bisbing's story, when you when you go in there and you win and you achieve things. But when you go in there like TJ, and you get taken down, your your shoulder pops out, and it's kind of you know curtains from there and. You know, just to mention on Sterling's side before we move on, I heard his corner shouting no mercy. He needs to just have no mercy. He needs to be going for a key lock or a Kimura or Americana on that or shoulder. A or a right height kick just, or something, yeah. Yeah, you know, you need to, you know, just fucking have no mercy, as his corner was saying. Just be ruthless in there and just rip that fucking shoulder if, if, if you can, you know. Maybe... You know, he knew he was going to win or whatever. But, the, you know, we saw Charles Oliveira lose and lands a big up kick. You know, if that lands a bit harder, maybe he knocks the guy out. We've seen it before. We've seen guys winning fights get hit with a, an up kick and they're out. Like, there's, there's still ways you can lose that fight. And you've got to be ruthless. You've got to be absolutely ruthless. But from TJ's point of view, you know, maybe it was a fact, like you are saying, oh, it's just like, oh, I know I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to show it's going to pop out straight away and it's going to take the payday. Or maybe he's lying to himself and he's like, I've been wrestling this the last few weeks. I'm, you know, hoping for the best, saying actually it's going to be fine. It's only, it's only, you know, I'll, not, I'll knock him out in the first round. It'll only be less than five minutes. Don't, it'll be fine. You know, I, I, I don't know if I totally agree with you on the fact that he definitely knew he was going to lose. I think these fighters are delusional. Like they have to be delusional in their self-belief. You know, they gotta, they gotta just have like this kind of blind spot. Uh, and we've seen guys go in with, with injuries. They shouldn't have gone in with before and actually win fights as well. And it's a great story. I mentioned the Bisping thing as well. You know, the, it, it's easy to say afterwards when it went so badly, when straight away you get taken down your shoulders out and you're, 
you know, pops back in, pops back out and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe he was, maybe, he, maybe you're right. And you know, I should be more cynical about it, but maybe, you know, I've seen these fighters up close. They are, they are really kind of, you know, optimistic <laughs> about their, yeah. about themselves and I, their I'd, injuries and things like that. I'd normally say that as well, but the fact that he did tell Goddard, like, we know it's going to pop out. It felt did like he, he was, say that though? Did he, he did say that though? Well, uh, Goddard said he said it, didn't he? So like, it, it felt uh, like he was defeated. It felt like he was defeated, gone in there, and like he didn't fight like a lad who was trying to knock him out with one hand. You know, he d- he didn't seem that way either. It, like, I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm just maybe I'm being a bit harsh on it, but I'm I have to. Come I'd say it's a lot of pain when your shoulders and oh, definitely yeah. position as a lad with like, a bad shoulder and trying to <laughs> post on it and frame. Oh, yeah. fucking nightmare. I hundred percent. Like I sympathy in that way for him, but like. I can't, we can't say it wasn't a sham of a fight. Like I have lots of different sympathies in lots of different ways. He didn't earn, he earned his money. And I feel sorry for Sterling that he didn't get a proper fight. But look, he got his money and everything like that as well. So no harm, no foul. probably thinking if I it. pull out of this and probably never get a title shot, I don't really deserve this title shot. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, you know, 100%. A lot of the, you know, uh, I think most fighters would have went in there. I don't think, Does EPO you know, a lot of people don't like Gillish off for a lot of Trump? things he did over the years with Alpha Male yeah. team and, drugs. you know, uh, yeah. drugs and bands and, you know, even people just don't like him in general but i think you know uh, nearly all fighters would have would have went in um you know he's he's been a champion before he's kind of uh, faded from relevance and kind of luckily or you know uh, undeservedly been put in this position and uh, i think he probably thought he could he could you know, have a small chance of going out there and getting a knockout and before his shoulder popped out, but obviously he got taken down straight away and it popped out. So, uh, it was pretty much over from then. And basically, like you yeah. said, it was just a, just a waste of time from then on. Yeah, and so, look, Sterling did what he needed as well and, and fair play to him. Do you know, one, yeah, just, did he though? I don't know. He should have, yeah, I think he should have done, done more. He could have done more. I think one big thing as well, it is a strange position to be put in, though, it as well. Is. He was kind of looking at the ref at one stage, being like, do you want to stop this? Or am I gonna, <laughs> yeah, he did. Well, what's going on here, mate? I, uh, I'm, you know, I was a bit surprised that there was a lack of, like, we have an EPO cheat in the uh, in a main event, or as a co-main event in a title shot uh, in the biggest card of the year uh, kind of talk here. Because, like, I'm not a big one for the, the drugs, like, uh, <laughs> for a, in terms of, like, I'm not, I don't get my high horse about USADA and all of that. It's just, I, I you know, I'm, I don't feel as strongly about it as other people. Uh, but, like, but TJ you know, Dillashaw people, uh, is an admitted <laughs> EPO cheat. Yeah, but if people like the, like, if people are pop- popular, you know, like, uh, it's no problem. They mm-hmm. forget about it, like you know, Donald Cerrone, you know, failed a drug test before. Yeah, but it, it, that, not even, not even random. Like yeah. you know what I mean? And uh, people just never talk about that, or mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think, but like this, that was a bit different because, like, okay, that was a long time ago, right? And you know, I'm sure he denies it, or it was like a, to cut weight or whatever. You know, John Jones denies it, and you know, people denied Lance Armstrong for a fucking decade. But T.J. Tillichot is like an admitted EPO cheat two years ago, three years ago. So you're saying people should lie about it and just pretend they didn't do it? It'd be better. <laughs> for him, honestly, it'd be better for him. I'm not. That's. I'm not saying that, but you know, you know what I mean. Like it's. I, I don't know. It just. It just. I felt like if this was in any other sport, and MMA is obviously very different from any other sport, but there would have been a lot more chatter about it and, and all that. And in here, uh, just uh, NFL people get what like, ah, well, like two days Just like oh, they're they're inactive this week. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, undisclosed injury or something. You know what I mean? It's yeah, not even fine. talked about. All right, let's move on. Talk about the rest of the card. So the Benil Ariush Matthias Gamrat fight, Graham. What a what a what a fight! What a performance from Benil Ariush. Been on Team Sheen for a long time. I saw his quality justified in my fandom of Benil. I think I have been uh, a really really great performance again. Sean was hashtag Sean was right. Uh, myself and Harry were talking about this and Harry was like oh he's not a great athlete you know Gamrat's such a better athlete he's going to out grapple him he's going to beat him and then even when that doesn't happen he's like no no you were wrong that didn't happen. fuck off Harry what are you talking about ah, yeah, if we were going to go over all the, the the fights me and you were wrong about no 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 I, I, well, I so. only talk about the fights <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I, I thought Darius was going to win but he, he really did look good here you know he looked really composed uh, picked the shots really well and you know Gamrod is definitely a difficult uh, style matchup for anybody like it's a it's a difficult grinding relentless kind of style but Darius just you know stayed composed stayed on his game and you know it was a really really good uh, 
kind of experience performance and uh yeah just a just a great all round three rounds from me i saw you know uh a lot of people gave the first round to gamrod as well there was definitely a definitely a close round but uh yeah i think uh, there was no there was no doubt in the end who won that fight and he kind of uh, as the fight went on i think he kind of figured out gamrod a bit and uh, it got a bit more comfortable for for um Darius as, as the fight went on and it was yeah. it was really really just a polished performance like him and Makachev is a very very interesting fight because if you look at uh, at Darius he can wrestle he's very good jiu-jitsu he's very good power very fighting, unorthodox for jiu-jitsu yeah. as well it's he different is, yeah. you know he's yeah, it's, a, it's a hard guy to train for it yeah so. I, I we talked about it on the preview show and I actually think he's like he's he doesn't look like the most athletic guy in the world, but he is really athletic. Like he, he's like a lad who does yoga fucking eight times a week or something. <laughs> he can he can move very very well. He's very supple, and it makes him very hard to hold down. Which and, and he is really good at holding guys on as well. I've never seen someone like be so light but so heavy at the same time. You know, yeah, and he just, he, he, I don't know if it's if it's uh, really happening or not, but it looks like he's just not expending energy. He's just yeah. flowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe he is tired after after the fights, but he looked like he was really fresh. You know, after you know a pretty relentless uh, twenty or not twenty five minutes, fifteen minutes. It's true, and the the weird thing about this as well is like we just talked there for five minutes uh, about Mikachev and Oliveira. Uh, sorry, Mikachev and uh, Volkanovski fighting next at one fifty five. Like Darius to be denied now is is very unfortunate for him. And you could say as well, okay, he doesn't maybe have the the names on, on his record. Although you know he has Tony Ferguson on there, uh, and he has Gamrat now, who anyone who knows is a very good fighter. He has Moises, he has Drew Dober, he has some very very good fighters uh, all the way down. But like. It looks like he's not going to get that shot now. What is he on a seven, seven, eight, eight, seven fight win streak now? He is uh, eight fight win streak. Sorry, he is such a good fighter. He deserves to get uh, that that big shot. He's thirty three years of age now as well. So this is his prime. This is the time he should be fighting. You know, and he's what twenty six, twenty seven fight. Um, it's it's a it's a shame, but he, he's not going to get it. Like we all know, unless there's an injury, unless something happens, he's probably going to have to fight again. And then who who are you going to fight? Who's going to like? Are you going to fight Gaethje? Are you going to fight Parry? Are you going to fight Chandler or something like that? Obviously, we have the Chandler and yeah. Parry fight coming up. It's a tough, think, tough situation. I think he is kind of missing that kind of big, you know, that big victory. Obviously, Gamrod and Tony Ferguson are, are big victories, but if he if he went out there and finished, you know, somebody with a big name, maybe that would like adding to that uh, an eight fight win streak then he'd be in uh, kind of the push for the title shot but at the moment he's just kind of flying under under the radar a little bit uh, still and you know he's he's not really banging on that door for for a title shot but you know it'd be interesting to see who they match him up against next and if he can go in there and no one fighting though lightweight is that weight for none of them lads and I've great respect for Gaethje and Chandler and Parry and all, but none of them lads will fight anyone but themselves or for the title. They really won't like like him versus Gaethje makes a bit of sense next, or him versus the winner of Parry versus Chandler. I don't see any of them fighting him. Like they're not going to. Oh, this is Benilar. Who's Benilar? Who's they're probably going to say? Like that should be the fight. It, we we should be making, but I I don't think it's going to happen. It's for, like I'm so interested to see what happens next with Darius. Is he, is like, he the Leon Edwards of the, <laughs> the, the, the lightweight division? Mm, yeah, he probably probably is. You know, he probably is. I, I actually does he need does he need to come out and talk more and call people out and getting getting no, notifications I, it, backstage and yeah, <laughs> get, it, getting fist, getting uh, handbag throwing <laughs> contests beside the cage and if we look at the way, way if we look at the way he talked after this he probably doesn't need to talk, to talk no because it was a bit cringe. Oh God, Aljamain Sterling so cringy as well after just uh, the absolute worst but anyway uh but yeah great performance from Darius and uh yeah good win Gamrat he'll be back as well because uh he you know he performed well he did well but Darius just better all around I would think at this stage sorry to Sean Denis for that one uh Malin Firo and Kaelin Chukagan we're not going to stay long on that uh honestly I missed the first round of this because I was watching in the Man United in Chelsea and do you know what I'm glad I did uh because it's well, it was it was all right. Like it was a good back and yeah. forth. Great win for Firo. She moves on. She might be fighting for the title next. But like when you're in a Chukagan fight, you know you either win or you turn into Chukagan yourself. And are you sorry? You either lose or you turn into Chukagan yourself. And Firo definitely turned into Chukagan for this. French Chukagan beat Chukagan via Chukagan basically here. And uh, she needed to do that. And we move on. And hopefully it'll be better next time. Ten and one, Graham. Ten and one, man on Firo. Do you know who the one is? No, Liam McCourt. 
Ah, so there you go. Sorry. Now, yeah, yeah. fair play to yeah, Irish, uh, the Irish doing well. So fair play to Sean O'Malley, Irish doing well. And lucky though, Sean Brady, an American, Sean Brady last to to Bilal Mohammed there. What a yeah, performance! I told you. What a performance! <laughs> oh, was this the one we bet money on? Oh, I can't even remember. I, think, I do. I think we I, did I, make, I make these bets on the podcast. And someone, someone tell us. Yeah. But an hour, when the podcast ends an hour later, I can't remember. Oh, uh, I, I forget it immediately. Yeah. I think we might have done two. I don't know. Anyway, we yeah we definitely did this one anyway. But you got it right. Um, a wonderful, a wonderful performance from Bilal. A very close first round, good back and forth. Both were landing hard. I thought Brady was actually fighting really well off the back foot, landing some very very good shots, and Bilal was coming forward but getting hurt. And uh, the, as I said, the Brady left hook. Bilal came on late as well in that first round, but Brady did look to have more pro- power. I think the pressure of Bilal really told in that second. The nose started to redden up on Brady. Bilal hurt him once, didn't put on the pressure. And, you know, it was probably a good stoppage by Lucas Bazaki. I think it was Lucas Bazaki anyway in the end, uh, standing TKO. But uh, Bilal, like when, you're, when you have the ability to stand up to the power shots that Brady lands... And when you have the ability to pressure him in such a way that he can't get out and it just intensifies and intensifies and intensifies and everything that Brady throws is just getting ate by Bilal who keeps coming forward and forward and forward. That's the start of fight. If you're, if you're Sean Brady and you're very importantly, you're 15 and all. That's the start of fight. You need to probably be 15 and three to win. If you get me like this, this loss will do him very, very well. I think, I think he needs to have a fight like this in the future again to see how he can live up to it, to change things, to realize I've been in this situation before. I need to do this, this and this in the preparation to change to, to when I get there again, I'll be able to do that. Very young still in his career, his first loss uh, and all of that. He's only, what, 29 years of age. He'll be back. But f- for this time, it was Bilal Muhammad's time. You know, 25 fights into his career, 34 years of age, beat Vicente Luque, Wonderboy Thompson, Damian Maya before this. What a run he's on. What an unbelievable run. And he needs to be right there or thereabouts now for, uh, for a title shot and another phenomenal performance here, Graham. Were you surprised in any way by this? I know, like uh, I was surprised it ended the way yeah. it did to be honest yeah me too I thought it was going to be a, a decision uh, you know for Bilal but uh, I think Sean Brady maybe I don't know if uh, it was the kind of relentlessness of Muhammad that tired him out or, or maybe he's carrying a little bit too much muscle in his upper body that it's hard to, to kind of sustain such a pace and maybe that was part of Bilal's thinking that he that he's going to slow down if, if I if I put this pace on him and for me it worked uh the standing TKO, like at uh, one stage, I was like, but Bala Muhammad, for his sake, better hope he, he gets to stop it here because he's throwing a lot of output. And if he doesn't put him away here, he could be extremely tired after this. But I think he saw that Brady was also tired and that probably, you know, played into the, the this is my moment to make it happen from Muhammad. And I actually think it was a good stoppage. Usually, I prefer for the, you know, the ref to kind of let the guy fall or take a knee, even. But I think he, there were so many shots and he just was, was kind of eating them. And when he did have his hands up, he wasn't really blocking them uh, intelligently. So I do think it was a good stoppage. I think it was a really good performance from Bilal Muhammad. But as you said, I don't think it was, you know, all that bad from Brady. I think there's a lot of things he can go back and take from that and, uh, you know, improve in the future. So, yeah, I think, as you said, a, a bit more experience. Maybe he could have he could have won that fight or nearly, nearly definitely gone to a decision anyway. But, uh Definitely a really good performance from Bilal Muhammad, and he's another one who's kind of been going under under the radar. Like you look, you mentioned a couple of his recent wins, like uh, very good wins, and another good win here against an undefeated guy on a, on a big card. So, be interesting to see who who he gets matched up against next as well. Yeah, it looks like they're doing Leon Edwards and Usman rematch in London in March. I think it is. So that's a long way. That's what five or six months away as well. Like, not our interim title in the apex. Not our interim title. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's probably going to need to take. Uh, uh, probably going to need to take a, another fight here. And uh, let me just have a quick look at the rankings here and see who's see who's there or thereabouts. But you've Colby and Shamayev are supposed to be fighting in London. That's obviously a bit too late as well. It's, Gil- it's Gilbert Burns matched up, is it? Gilbert Burns, yeah, that's interesting. I don't think Gilbert is matched up, is he? Yeah, maybe the Gilbert fight uh, makes it. Let me just look here. Yeah, no, I don't think Gilbert is matched up. Him versus Gilbert does make a lot of sense. It's a tough fight though for Mah- for Mohammed to have to take, but I suppose in a division, that but if you goes. want to get into a title shot, these are the kind of guys you got to beat. Yeah, 
God, just him make him versus Shavkat Rachmanov. Let's let's see how let's see how that goes. That'll be a fun one. But uh, I don't. Uh, poor Bilal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't want to do that for him. But yeah, very very interesting and a great win there for uh, for remember the name Bilal. Mohammed, uh, I almost forgot his name. There, uh, Kobahal got in, my guy <laughs> went, went in, and he beat uh, Mahmoud Muradov. Some of you know, look good on the feet, look good on the ground, nothing too much to, to write home about. Uh, another good performance from uh, Bahalia, definitely a guy to keep an eye on there as he kind of rolls through. As he said, I don't, he kept like ranking himself and the other lads around him. He's like, Oh, I'm ranked like number 27, he was ranked number 29, I want to fight number 23. Where the fuck? Is he getting these rankings sure. from? Is that sure dog or fight topology. matrix or something? Or the, uh, North Sherdog. American rankings. Or yeah, Sherdog only do the top ten, and actually, I see the Sherdog lads talking about how they do the rankings, and it's actually really fucking intelligent. I, I wish the actual rankings were as intelligent as the lads who decide the Sherdog rankings. They're actually really good at it. And I, I must say, I give him a compliment for that. I, I don't. What know are if, you saying about the the Instagram pages voting on the UFC rankings? Are yeah, a good job? <laughs> no, the the uh, eight oh five the heat in Florida is. Uh, <laughs> The, their this jockey is doing a great job. And of they're not on top of things, no? yeah. Not <laughs> Mikey from uh, Mikey, Mikey, Mikey the dog from uh, eight oh four eight the heat. <laughs> that's that's he's like <laughs> for, for Mikey. That's what it is. But anyway, uh, oh fuck, Nikita Krylov, God Almighty! I've never been as frustrated watching the fight. He he could have finished Vulcan Altsmir about five times in this fight, and he just clinched and badly <laughs> tried to take him down every time. I was now I did have a bet in this fight. Round, the first round, the first round. How man. did he score that first round? I, can't, I don't Ozdemir, care. I can't remember. I rocked was, him, and but Krylov kind of was going for a rear naked choke. He had it under the chin, but it, to me it looked kind of uh, oh, a yeah. strange angle. Uh, for me, I didn't think it was as close as maybe the the commentators would. No, have he didn't have a great. Yeah, he didn't have a great. Uh, I can't remember to be honest, but I, I was. Yeah, yeah I'd, Ozdemir probably won it, but Krylov won the rest of the fight anyway, so it didn't make much of a difference. But uh, yeah, it's really uh, Ozdemir is really a one round fighter. Like if he doesn't he is, get it done yeah. in the first round, it really just all falls apart, and we, yeah. we saw that again. Eat, pray, Krylov. Uh, Abu Bakr and Magomedov. Then that was a kind of a shite fight against Omar Gadziev, Petrosian. I kind was of just, illegal knee in that one. Oh, there was. Yeah. yeah, actually, was that that one? Uh, yeah, it was a legal point. knee in that one and in the the Lena Landsberg. Yeah, they uh, took them. Oh, that, yeah, actually, that was good refereeing. It was uh, Bozaki again, wasn't it? Who the, who it was the same man. ref in both. Uh, yeah, I think he must have said, thought that the in the first fight, in the women's fight, that yeah. it was a more, more impactful more powerful, strike more impactful, than it was. Yeah. In the, and it was, I think. Yeah. I, I think he made the right decision on ball counts, to be honest. Uh, so I, I thought he could, did a good job. I think most people agreed with that. Uh, Petrosian fight, not great. Uh, Carl Rosa Lin- Landsberg fight Landsberg almost knocked her out early uh, and then obviously there was a couple of 10-8s and it turned into a majority win for Carl Hosa so fair play to her and then we had Mah- Mohamed Mikhaev <sighs> he got the f- look he dominated this fight for the most part apart from the end of the second round where he was kind of caught in a choke but not really got the ar- Amber 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 we're 2022 and we still have Amber but uh I'm not impressed by Mikhail's performance here at all. I'm impressed by him. He's a great fighter and f- fantastic fighter and fantastic prospect. He needs to stop this bollocksing because this is MMA and you will get caught bollocksing like he was, like looking into the crowd, trying, like not even natural, like trying to do the thing, you know, where you put your hand in front of your eyes and you're like, oh, where did that shot go, man? It landed in the- and uh, oh, my God, he needs to stop. He needs to stop that shit because it's another, not aggressive. Another thing that I, like, obviously he went in there and won and it was like good to get the time in the cage against a guy in his 20th fight and all that. But, and he, like, he, you know, he'll come out of there and learn a lot of things, but he's going to have to work on his, uh, how easily his back was getting taken. You know, as, as you move up to divisions, people are going to snatch your back and choke you out real quick if, if you give them an opportunity, like, or if you give them easy opportunities, like it seemed. Malcolm Gordon was given. He seemed to take the back in without too much, uh, you know, effort a couple of times. And obviously, he, uh, uh, Muhammad was able to fight out and get the armbar. But as as you go up the levels, uh, I know he's only he's only eight and zero now, and he's very young. But 
hopefully they keep him on the kind of slow and steady track because he definitely, you know, there was, there was definitely holes in, in his performance there that will be exploited as you, as you go up the division. And he needs a he loss. Needs, He's the sort of fellow, the loss, uh, loss would be the best thing that could ever fucking happen. To even, him. even taking a little bit of time from fighting so regularly and putting more time in the gym, maybe on, on certain aspects of that fight, you know, uh, you know, the, as I said, the way his back was taken so easily a couple of times, uh, that's maybe it was just him being reckless because he he kind of knew he had to beat in the Gordon, but you know, in a moment somebody can snatch your back uh, and and sink in a choke, and then and then you know you've you've fucked up the whole thing with your with your messing. So maybe that plays into it, but you know that's something he's got to learn as well, as you said. Uh, it's all well and good if it's kind of part of your personality, but. Uh, uh, it does seem a little bit forced to me and uh, he needs to kind of be zoned in on, on the fight and not be worrying about all, all this other stuff uh, you know I think with people like the Diaz brothers it's just kind of part of their personality yeah. and if they didn't fight like that it would be strange but yeah I think I agree with you that he just needs to forget all about that if, if you're if you're uh, if you're winning the fight uh, easily then instead of taunting people, just put the guy away earlier. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's 100%. more impressive than, than you know, taunting 100%. people. I'm glad, I'm glad you were on the same thing as me because I thought I was just being an old man roaring a cloud there. So if, if, I, if I didn't have such high expectations for him, you know, I, maybe yeah, I'd be like, yeah. oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm just like, saying, you know, this is a guy who can go really, really far if he, yeah. you know, closes holes in his game, which seemed to be... He needs you know, a bit more ground about easily, him, doesn't he? Easily enough clo- to, yeah. to be worked on and closed. So 100%. as long as, you know, everything doesn't go to his head and he knuckles down, I, I have really high hopes for this guy. Knuckle down now, Mohammed. knuckle down. You know we know all about it next year when you're playing number 14. Anyway, uh, we will look ahead to next week in a second. There were two one championship cards, which I watched intensely this week. Um, uh, not 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 loads of stuff here on it, to be honest. Uh, Reese McLaren looked very good and got a good win over Winston Hamas. Gustavo Ballard, Graham, 4 foot 11, beat Alex Silva in a split decision. Uh, Echo Ronnie Saputra, if you don't know this guy, he's fucking unbelievable. He's 7 and 1, he's won seven first round finishes in a row, beat Y2K there. Looked very good. Artem Balak got a win there uh, as well, and there was a few Mai Tai fights and stuff like that. Then on the second card, we had um, some very interesting fights. Um, um, there was Shamil Gasanov, 13 and 0, beat uh, Jae Won Kim, who knocked out um, Martin Huyn a couple of fights ago. That Gasanov is unbelievable. Like he 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 reminds me a little bit of of Mikachev, I suppose. Uh, very very good on the ground, throws big wild shots on the feet as well. Um, very good fight, Jeremy Miado, Daniel Williams, Daniel Williams like a kickboxer, and Jeremy Miado out kickboxed him and uh, put on a very very good uh, win there and Noel Grandjean beat Leah Bivens but I suppose the biggest fight from the week in the one championship John Lineker and Fabrizio Di Andrade uh, and even enough fight at the start uh, I actually did a, a review of it over on Sherdog sure so if you want to listen to that whole thing there but the fight ended in the third round with um, a, a grind stroke by Andrade to Lineker which broke his uh, grind shield and I think they were like looking for a replacement couldn't find one and then John Lineker was just riding around in pain at the time though Lineker had been like badly beaten his eye was closed looked really really bad um, and the fight was stopped and ended in a no contest so not two good cards from one championship not great there was some good kickboxing actually on, on both of them I'm a mad kickboxing fan now Graham absolutely uh, you know I'm mad into the Muay Thai because I'm being forced to watch it for sure dog but it's actually pretty good to be honest so um, yeah good stuff from one championship as always next week then UFC and Bellator the UFC is Calvin Cater versus Aaron Dallin which we spoke about a second ago other than that in the cards not much uh, Tim Means versus Max Griffin not a bad fight Andre Arlovsky is on the fight. Chase Hoop on the card. Sorry, Chase Hooper is back as well. And I can't really, I don't really see much after that. Who do you think wins that Cater Allen fight, Graham? Ooh, you know, I think on the feet, probably maybe Allen has a bit more power, but Qatar is a bit more uh, technical. <sighs> I think Arnold Allen will probably get it done, but I think this will be a really close decision. Uh, I, I could see it going either way, you know. Uh, I think it's uh, it's a really difficult one to pick. I think it's going to be, you know, close rounds all the way. It could be 3-2 either way. Yeah, yeah, I would tend to agree. I, I think 
I always pick Aaron Allen Strint to win fights, and uh, I'll pick him to win this one again. But uh, should be a uh, should be an interesting one. Then Bellator have a card. I need I need to honestly I need to watch more. Um, I need to watch more uh, footage for this main event. Adam Pigalati against Mansar Barnois. Um, everyone's talking about Mansar being very, very good. He's won a lot of fights in a row, fighting over in road, uh, FC and other places. I haven't seen a load of him, to be honest. I, uh, and people are probably saying, what are you talking about? Um, I saw his, I think he was on KSW. He fought years ago and was, was impressed with him. But, he, you know, I'm looking at his, uh, yeah, it was KSW. Uh, he lost to, he's lost to Bushinger and, and Gamrat years ago, but he's won all these fights since 2000 and what? 16. So he's on a very, very good run there. Uh, on the undercard, there's some, you know, a lot of fighters that we know around here, some SBG fighters, some UK fighters as well. Sal Rogers fighting Tim Wilde, you know, a fun local UK fight. Um, Andrew Fisher's on the card against Justin Gonzalez. Daniel Scatizzi, obviously, he's fighting out of SBG, isn't he? He's fighting Davy Gallon. So that's, uh, that's a bit of a step up there for, uh, for Scatizzi. Uh, I believe Thibaut Guti is fighting Alfie Davis. That actually should be a fun fight. Simon Biang against Draga Subarchke. Costello Van Stienis is buried in the middle of this fucking card. Uh, Costello Van Stienis, if people don't know, beat Fabian Edwards last time out. Uh, and Fabian Edwards is in the quite main event here. And Costello, I don't know. It's even, do people even know he's on the card? Luke Trainer's on the card. Nicola Ciolo is on the card as well. But the one I suppose Graham Weir, we'd be most interested in Fabian Edwards versus Charlie Ward, a fight that's been talked about for a long, long, long time. Um, a friend of mine actually. He follows Charlie Ward's like strength and conditioning coach on uh, on Instagram, and he sent me like three different videos of him uh, like preparing Charlie. And he seems like a really smart guy. And Charlie seems in unbelievable shape. He sent me one last night. He was in like a um, a jacuzzi, and he said he was eighty nine point nine kg, so I think about thirteen pounds overweight with five days to go, which you know isn't isn't too too bad for a one eighty five pound fighter, I suppose. Uh, so Charlie. By all accounts, um, Ian talked to Kieran Davern as well, didn't he? And he, by all accounts, Charlie is in unbelievable shape and has put in the camp of his life for this fight. And do you know, he needed it's a tough matchup against Fabian Edwards, but big fight here for Charlie and a fun, fun should be a fun striking matchup against Fabian Edwards, Graham. Yeah, I think you know, for uh, it could be a fun striking match, but I think for Charlie, uh, the route to victory here is to put on a relentless kind of wrestling display, frustrate Fabian, make him worried about the takedown, even just push up against the cage and dirty box him. I think out, out in the open, I think, uh, you know, Edwards is, has an advantage. And, you know, uh, over the years, we talked about Edwards maybe needing to let it go, uh, let the shots go. And I think, uh, you know, he's going to have to do that again. He's going to have to let the shots go here. If he's hesitant, he, he could easily get pushed up against the cage and kind of uh, worn down by Charlie Ward here. This is obviously a huge fight for Charlie. He's been, as you said, he's been kind of kind of trying to position himself for this fight for a long time and he's obviously uh, you know working working hard to get into shape and put in a, uh, a long training camp uh, as you said and he's looking in he's looking in really really good shape so uh, I definitely think Fabian has a, has an advantage on, on, on the feed here but I think Charlie just has to make it dirty has to make it relentless has to go back to the kind of the the grinding style and just frustrate Fabian out there and make him hesitant to throw uh, and that's his route to victory but uh yeah it's definitely it's definitely a difficult matchup for 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 um Charlie especially you know with the range of striking on the feet he has to he has to kind of take that away from Fabian if he's going to win this fight in my opinion yeah I think you broke that down perfectly like if you stay at range and let Fabian fight like a long fight it's probably you know it's probably not going in well not for Charlie but for anyone but Charlie has been fighting a lot recently like as you said, relentless, you know, it's his, it's his nickname and all, but, you know, going forward, pushing the lad against the cage, taking him down, which is a big departure, I suppose, from what Charlie Ward was on the way up, which was just, you know, a big, hard striker. He's turning, you know, into a, that sort of relentless, well-rounded sort of fighter, and that's... Uh, yeah, there's definitely a path to victory there, but like Leon or uh, Fabian Edwards, sorry, he's going to be a big, big favourite here, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a very, very interesting matchup. Like Fabian as well, it's a massive time for him, you know. Leon is the champion over in the UFC. He he beat Machida last time out. If he gets this win, he can't be too far away from uh, from a title. I remember I asked Scott Coker. Um 
if he was like thinking about doing Leon Edwards, I think it was ver- or, I keep calling him Leon Fabian Edwards versus um, Machida. I think it was at the time. This is like a few months ago for the title, and I remember he said, "Oh yeah, that's definitely something we would think about." Or he well, he wasn't against it anyway. So like they do think of Fabian, I suppose in that in that talk. Now it's funny with Casella Vancina, the lad who just beat him underneath. Like I know maybe that's a fight they make as well if Casella wins on this uh, on this card. So uh, interesting times ahead for. Uh, for Fabian and a big fight for him as, as well as a big fight for Charlie and uh, you know Irish MMA you know we have uh, obviously Charlie there and we just had the Bellator Nikolai, 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 Nikolai as you meant yeah. or uh, yeah then Yelly not, not, not Nikolai Nico uh, yeah. he's obviously his only loss is to George Hardwick in, in Bellator's Euro Series and obviously mm-hmm. George Hardwick is the Cade Warriors champion now and uh, Nick, Nico is a training partner with Connor and obviously has got a lot of sparring in so he's He's maybe uh, a little bit as a, as a obviously an undefeated amateur as well. He's been around a long time since uh, 2016. His first uh, listed uh, amateur fight is on topology, so he's uh, you know maybe flying under the radar a bit in terms of uh, guys guys training in Ireland uh, at SPG. But uh, he's you know uh, definitely a good prospect as well. And you know that George Hardwick loss doesn't doesn't you know it looks better than maybe it did at the time. It doesn't look as bad as it did at the time. So I'd be interested to see how he looks here uh, at Bellator. Yeah, indeed. And obviously we've cage warriors coming up in uh, in two weeks' time, so we'll have a full breakdown of that next week. Can't wait to that. Uh, can't wait for that. You mentioned Connor there as well. I saw last night Dana White actually mentioned, and it, he said in a very kind of weird coy way. That like, you know, so there's been this thing going around about McGregor. We talked about it before. I've been asked, obviously, in the Q&A a few times about it. Uh, that like he hasn't been tested in USADA in a year or something like that. And Dana White basically said last night that Connor's going to need to do six months in USADA testing before he can fight. So that would suggest, you know, like Henry Cejudo or whoever else it might be, that he was retired and, you know, will uh, put, was out of the USADA testing pool and will need to go back in it now. This was brought up obviously a while back. I think it was my guy Andy Hickey who brought it up and was like, "Oh, no one's talking about this," uh, even though we talked about it a few times. But anyway, um, I reached out to you, Sada, as did many people, and what I got back was basically what everyone else got back. So, you know, copy and paste, it's copy and paste type of thing. Like you need to contact the UFC. We don't say who is in or out of the testing uh, pool. But what Check we will say, Check yeah, what we, yeah, no, what, what we will say is the website is correct. So they basically confirmed that McGregor hadn't been tested uh, in the last year, uh, which is is interesting. I'd like at the start, I was kind of thinking, right, we were in the middle of the pandemic. Did was there a breakdown of communications between like the Irish testing or the you know whatever it might be in USADA? And I was I, I don't know what way was it w- was kind of working out, but it looks like. I, I'd be very like someone needs to answer this. Like Dana, Dana was asked the question, but in a weird way where he kind of didn't really answer it. Like I would love, uh, you know, if I was interviewing Connor tomorrow, that'd probably be the first thing anyone would ask him, I suppose. But like, uh, I'd love to know what was the reason. Like, was it like oh, I'm injured? I brought my leg. Uh, fuck this. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm retired. Take me out of the testing. Was like, I'm not going to be fighting for the next two years. I don't want to have this hassle of people calling to my door at six o'clock when I'm in fucking Barbados or when I'm shooting a film or whatever it might be. Um, I'll, when I come back, I'll give you six months notice. I'll come back in, which is like, <laughs> you know, you can either agree with, disagree with that. You could take your own opinion up on that, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a story and definitely something I suppose that will be talked about over the next while. But, um, yeah, it, it's, you saw that as in a very interesting place in the UFC in the moment all around, and maybe it's a hot topic or, uh, or uh, a speaker's corner that we need to talk about in a while, but, uh, yeah, it's, it feels like it's in the weirdest place it's been since it kind of came, but anyway, um, Slap fighting, Graham. What do you think? Oh, you a fan? Just brain damage fighting. I brain don't know. Pro, brain yeah. damage slapping. Competitive CTE is an absolute fucking <laughs> joke. Dana White's giving out about Ben Fox, then calling him a goofball and all. He calling someone a goofball when you're putting on fucking slap fighting, you absolute embarrassment. But uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's it's actually like pretty disgusting if I'm being honest it's rotten like MMA and boxing and combat sports are all like they're, the tenant they're based on is being able to intelligently defend yourself like that's literally what we talk about in MMA if someone's not intelligently defending themselves we stop it this is like you're not allowed to intelligently defend yourself that's what it's all about you know we talk about hit and not getting hit this is about hitting and getting hit 
<laughs> you know, it's it's actually it's ridiculous. It is uh, snuff film stuff. It's absolutely awful. And uh, yeah, we leave it at that. Graham, Jake, Paul, Anderson, Silva. You looking forward to it next week? Oh, I didn't know it was next week. There hasn't been that much no, hype around it, has there? Or have I just missed oh, it? Oh, very little. Yeah, a bit maybe. Yeah. I, I know we're not going to talk. I'm about actually, it, I'm actually, you know, I probably won't bother watching it, but I'm interested to see what the, or the, the highlights afterwards, just to, you know, yeah. to see what Anderson looks like and to see where Jake Paul is. But I definitely wouldn't be paying any money to watch it. No, it'd be hilarious if fucking Anderson won. I, I don't yeah, I don't, like I think, like I don't know anything about Jake Paul. I haven't even seen his boxing bouts or anything. But he's not bad. Anderson like he Silva, can box. Anderson Silva, like I know he's old and all that, but. He had a pretty good win there recently in boxing and uh, apparently deserved decision. So he's no mug anyway. He's not some basketball player that, that Jake Paul is, is boxing. But yeah, I still can't really get too uh, interested in, in these kind of YouTube boxing guys. But yeah, I, I am more intrigued by this one than I was by the other ones. But that doesn't say much. I'm going to watch House of the Dragon finale tonight. Have you been watching it? No, no, no. no. Do you ever watch Game of Thrones back in the day? No, I tried to watch ah, and people were like, oh, you need to watch like an episode and then you'll be hooked yeah. and I watch an episode. Oh, you need to watch two episodes and I watched uh, two episodes and yeah. I actually didn't even get to the end of the second episode. I was like, oh, ah, I'll just watch great. it another time. This is fucking... Man, it's the greatest show of all time. Yeah. You can actually watch this one first because it's 172 years oh, before that. So, oh, <laughs> you know, get into this. Get into this. My guy Otto Hightower is going to gonna fuck shit up tonight. But anyway, we leave it there. <laughs> Long podcast again. I appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, if you enjoyed this and you want more, uh, we have loads of stuff up on our YouTube. Spencer Clyde has come over. Our Patreon as well. If you would like to support us and help keep the lights on, uh, it's only the price of a hot chicken roll per month. So patreon.com forward slash severe and podcast. Or you can just go to severe forward slash pints, P I N T S price of a pint a month for us. You get a podcast almost every day. And uh, it'd be great to help us out. And obviously head on over to Manscaped as well. Use that promo code SEVERE and may get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com and head into Tesco as well and try them out there. If you haven't heard the old triangle as well, check that out. If you haven't, as I said, seen our YouTube, check that out and hit the subscribe button over there. If you're listening to this on SoundCloud or iTunes or wherever you're listening to it, hit the subscribe button there. Leave us a comment at Sean Sheen Bia, at Graham no, at Severe Me, at Severe Me Pod over on Twitter, at Severe Me dot com on Instagram, and we're on Facebook as well. I'm Sean Chi, and that was Graham McDonald. That was the podcast. Graham, give us the inspirational quote of the week. It's not inspirational, but I'll give it to you. Uh, <laughs> and in the darkened underpass, I thought, oh God, my chance has come at last. But then a strange fear gripped me, and I just couldn't ask. We'll see you next Sunday. Good luck.